What's up, everyone, and welcome to The Corporate Bartender. Do you ever feel stuck? Have the last couple of years just taken it all out of you? Do you want to recapture some of that old magic? Well, if so, you're in the right place. We've got Randy Roberts on the program to help you do just that. If you don't know Randy, no worries. We're going to get up close and personal with this executive and career life coach. She calls herself a hippie with an Ivy League education. Randy has an MBA from Wharton, has spent 30 years in corporate America, and has walked the path that many of us trod today. She's also the host of her own podcast, Fulfilling Career, Happy Life. This conversation was a blast, and I think you're all going to dig it. So buckle up, TC Beers, grab your favorite cocktail, and let's get right on into it with Randy Roberts on today's TCB. Welcome to Sky Team's The Corporate Bartender, where we gather some of the best HR and people leaders to discuss what's happening on the people side of business. Now pull up a stool, belly up to the bar, and join us for The Corporate Bartender. Welcome, everybody. It's good to see each and every one of you. It's Wednesday. It's your favorite day and mine. It's Corporate Bartender Day. It is the 26th of April, 2023, and this is the 166th time we have convened this group of amazing folks. Today is going to be a good day. We will do our welcome stuff like we do. We've got a news item, and today we have a guest. It's Randy Roberts, the hippie with the Ivy League education. (laughs) She's going to join us today. We're going to talk about getting unstuck. For those of you not in the room today, but following on at a future point in time, I'm going to keep asking because Morag's here today and I am a pain in the ass. Please pick up a copy of our book, You, Me, We, Why We All Need a Friend at Work and How to Show Up as One. And if you already have a copy, please pop over to Amazon and write us a review because once you get to 100, magic happens, apparently. I don't know what that is, but we're trying to figure it out. Magic happens <laughs> i'm sure it has to is. do somehow with unicorns and rainbows so of mm-hmm. course it does you gotta write them <laughs> ruby look okay. at your heart it's twinkling i know that's Ooh. new uh-huh. that's exciting sorry folks you, on the on the radio you who can't see you can turn on um motion sensor now mm-hmm. so that if you mm-hmm. actually wave it'll pull or if you do yeah I find that I gesticulate so much. It's it's really yeah. counterproductive for me. It's confusing. <laughs> yeah, because there's thumbs up that pop up and I can't make them go away when I'm presenting. <laughs> I'm like, ah, oh, I struggle. I struggle. Oh, wow. The struggle is real. <laughs> All right, we've got some guests upcoming on May 10th. Wanda Wallace will be here. She's the author of You Can't Know It All, Leading in the Age mm. of Deep Expertise. I got her book the other day. It's fascinating. There's also a deck of cards that I haven't gotten into yet. I'm looking forward to that. Um, May 24th, we have the rescheduled Alan Hunkins, author of Cracking the Leadership Code, Three Secrets to Building Strong Leaders. Looking forward to that one. We were supposed to do that a couple of weeks ago, but the real job and traveling to places and doing real work got in the way of podcasty funness. All right, so today... We are going to talk to Randy Roberts. And who is Randy Roberts? I, she's a hippie with an Ivy League <laughs> education. She got an MBA from Morton. She got a BA from in sociology from San Diego State. So I have surfing questions for Randy. Um, but she's, she's an accredited coach. And uh, Randy helps people get unstuck. So we're going to talk about getting unstuck today. At least that's where we're going to start. So let's welcome Randy with a good old TCB welcome, shall we? We dance everybody in, Randy. That's what we do. Okay, I feel good and welcome. Thanks, Eric. (laughs) (laughs) Welcome to the show. Thanks for being here with us today. And in the spirit of getting unstuck, a lot of times we will share a news item. We call it news you can use. And I saw this article it came out last, well, uh, two years ago now, 2021, uh, in Forbes about getting unstuck. And there was some research <clears throat> that had been done by Oracle and Workplace Intelligence. And basically, they were looking back over the past couple of years, you know, the pandemic years, and 
80% of people felt negatively impacted. This was a study of over 14,000 people. So statistically significant. They felt negatively impacted in terms of their finances, mental health, career motivation, and just stress in general. And lack of control and feeling stuck were especially common. Um, people were reporting this loss of control, feeling loss of control over their future, their personal lives, their careers, their relationships, and feeling trapped in their routines and more lonely than they've ever felt before. And we had a loneliness epidemic before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, and that's only gotten worse. And I don't know that it's gotten better with the the return to office and all the angst and anxiety that's gone with the changing schedules of what that means. We have several clients who have tried many iterations of return to office. And I don't know that anybody's settled into a forever groove at this point in time. So it's a problem. People feel stuck and they feel like they don't have control over many facets of their life. And in this article, the the bullet points to getting unstuck of course it's a you know eight minute read five minute read in forbes um it's not super deep but the getting unstuck center points were a few assessing what's going on and reflecting just spending a little bit of time thinking about your priorities and you know we saw this in the pandemic sort of writ large with folks deciding that, you know what, I don't want to do the same job that I've been doing for the last 15 years, going to the same place, building that same routine. I'm missing out on life. I was, I was chatting with a, a coaching client today and we were talking about, I asked him if he was back in the office full time and he was like, no. And he said, and I'm so happy because I've got a nine-year-old kid and I'm not missing her life. I would have before and I wouldn't have even noticed right? So this assessment and reflection, more ag typed into the chat, look up in our book, the award-winning You, We, Me, several awards. It's one. <laughs> Lori Freemeyer reminded me. Um, we end each chapter with a section called look up, show up, step up. And look up is the sort of, let's just take stock of what's going on. So assessing and reflecting, number one. Number two was learn stuff tap into new ideas. And it doesn't have to be learning things about your job or that's germane to your career, just learning stuff, engaging your brain, connecting to something that's, that's bigger and different than what you're doing right now, which I loved. And, and then the last, if, if I can interject real quick yeah. there, I thought it was important to note that because of how much most of us are involved in social media, right. To, to varying degrees and how, the algorithms are built to drive more of the same of whatever mm. you're looking at. It like doubles down on narrowing your focus of what your mind is thinking about. And so I loved that it was like, go take a dance class, like yeah, totally different, right? It's not about, well, I'm going to read more articles about all the same stuff that I read all the time. <laughs> it was yeah. really about broaden that scope significantly. Yeah. Stimulating your curiosity right? Mm -hmm. Not just, and, and I know we all feel compelled. I do leadership development work for a living. And boy, every day, there's an article you can read. Um, every day, there's a new piece of research you can read. And sometimes I feel obligated to read those things because my email tells me that I should. And some days I want to read a Star Wars book. I don't want to read mm -hmm. work stuff, right? So I get it. And I think that's great. The last two points were about support getting it and giving it, right? Because as a depression kid, I know depression and anxiety are rooted in that feeling of control or lack of control. Um, and so being open about that is super helpful. You know, I talk about it, I write about it, I will engage with anybody that wants to have a conversation about it. N not just because I want to help people, but because it feels good to me too. It feels good for me to acknowledge it and, you know, seek kindred spirits in the world who have similar experiences, right? So seeking that support and giving that support, I thought were great. Um, and then the last point was about selectively stopping things. Mm -hmm. And we talk about this all the time, you know, in our professional lives, many of us keep getting asked to do more with less all the time. 
And that's, that's okay. I mean, I think about it this way. When somebody gets hired to do a job, that job is like this much. It's, you know, picture a bar chart that's, you know, 25% to the top of the, of the scale. That's your job. And then something happens and somebody leaves or an event happens. We do a reorganization and somebody goes, hey, Lori, would you mind just taking on this little bit extra just until we fill the role, just until we get it under control? And then life moves on and we forget we asked Lori to do this job. And now that bar is at, you know, 35%. And this happens again and again and again. And two or three years into your career, you find you're doing a whole lot more than you thought you were going to be doing. And you feel too overwhelmed to make a change, right? So, and a lot of coaching clients and anybody that's coaching right now can chime in on this one. Um, I've said to coaching clients in the past, when, when your boss puts another thing on your desk, do you ever ask, okay, happy to take that on. What am I not doing? Right. What comes off the plate? Yeah. <laughs> Most of them that, go, Oh God, no, I could never say that. It, that I, whole thing on boundaries. Right. I, yeah. Eric, I think what you're saying is so important because the reality is there are limits. Like mm -hmm. the plate can only get so full and things are going to fall off of it. And the truth is, if you never say no to anything, you're never powerfully saying yes to anything. Oh, I love that. It's yours now. I share it yeah. with you. Yeah, no, wow. thank you. Um, so yeah. Randy, these are pretty basic things. How do these line up with your thoughts and coaching around this idea of taking back control and getting unstuck? Yeah, you know, you're right. They are basic things, but there's so much wisdom in this article. It's I'm so glad that you brought it up. And it really starts where I start with a lot of people about getting unstuck, which is the assessing and reflecting. Because something that I believe deeply in is if you don't know the problem you're trying to solve, you you're if you solve it, it was by accident. <laughs> so it really starts by trying to figure out what's missing where you are. What do you need that you're not getting? What is there too much of that you can't handle or isn't fulfilling anymore? Um, and once you get clear on that, then you can figure out, can you solve it right where you are? Mm. Or do you need to make a bigger change? And, and I think something that's important about that is the time, hopefully, the time to assess and reflect is before you get to the crisis point, mm. because it may take a little bit of time to figure it out. And so while you're doing that, you can be looking around and, and sort of putting some other things in motion and opening up that curiosity that you mentioned. So I think assessing and reflecting is exactly where it starts. Excellent. That's a great place to start. So let's start with your journey. I don't imagine that when you were but a child, you said, I want to grow up to be this executive and career life coach and help people get unstuck. Truly not. So tell us, how did that start? Tell us a little bit about your journey. You can start from wherever you like. You can start from childhood. You can, I had one guy uh, start from birth. He said, well, I was born in wherever he was born. And I was like, great, take it. So tell us your story. I think we can all assume that I was born. So let's skip forward a little Excellent. bit. <laughs> you know, it's interesting because one thing I actually do want to touch on from childhood, because like life sends us messages somehow, like we develop these stories and we develop these perspectives, whether they're right or wrong. It was like our lived experience. And I think a lot of what my early life told me was I better be self-sufficient. I better be able to count on myself. And I better be willing to help other people. And I think those things sort of are true for me even today. But one of the things that I've always known about myself is that I, ha I have this need to do some good while I'm doing well. Like both of those things are really important to me. And so I feel very lucky that I fell into my first career in pharmaceuticals. Like literally was working in a doctor's office after college, trying to figure out how I was going to support myself. What was this plan going to be? <laughs> Got to be friends with the pharmaceutical reps that came in and literally fell into a career that I absolutely loved. And so I worked my way up. Um, you know, the biggest job I had was running a billion dollar business for one of the biggest pharma companies in the world. Um, and almost every day of 30 years, I like jumped up before the alarm, couldn't wait to get to work. 
knew that I was doing some good for patients, contributing to healthcare while I was doing well for my family and building the security that I needed and all that. And then it felt like overnight, instead of jumping out of bed before I hit, you know, before the alarm went off, I was hitting the snooze button. I was not as eager. Like I was more excited about Friday than I was about Monday and, and all those things. And it really was important for me to take a look at what did this mean? Was this like a mid career or midlife crisis? Was this that I was on the wrong path? Like I really had to do that assessing and reflecting and figure out what was going on for me. And what I felt that I felt like I was too, was that applause? (laughs) That was, I didn't mean to do that. Okay. What I'm waiting for the Eric is when I say something and I hear the magic music. Oh, there. Yeah. So I'll I'll be, I'll be ready for magic. Okay. (laughs) I need need that validation. So I'm waiting for it. (laughs) Anyway. So what I found was I had gotten too far away from the connection I felt of the doing good part. Like Mm. I knew my little piece of being in the healthcare industry was pharmaceuticals make people's lives healthier, better, extended, whatever that is. And I really tapped into that. But the bit, the higher up I got in a big bureaucratic organization, the farther I felt from Mm. that, it was more about aligning the, the planet so that I could get the resources I needed for my team, explaining why things weren't going the way they were supposed to, explaining why we were exceeding our goals, whatever that was. It was very internally focused and it just wasn't doing it for me anymore. So once I figured that out and, and actually part of it, I think too, was I had achieved my dream job mm-hmm. and I no longer had that big goal mm-hmm. because I had achieved it. And I think something was missing there too. And I work with a lot of clients on that kind of thing now. Like what the, my goal is missing. I didn't even realize it was missing. What am I filling that with? So all of those things going on. And really it was time for me to, to make a big pivot in my career. And so, you know, I was fortunate. I was high enough in the corporation. I was able to engineer a situation where my job was no longer needed. So I left (laughs) with a cushion and when I realized like, okay, this doing some good while I'm doing well thing, what does this mean for me at this point in my life? Mm -hmm. My daughter's grown and gone. That phase of, you know, raising a child is over. I'm no longer in this corporate world. What does this mean? And when I did some reflecting, I realized that some of the most pivotal points I had had in my career were in working with a coach. When I had taken on big new levels of responsibility and felt very lonely and very unsure and having a lot of those, you know, holy smokes, what do I do now moments? I don't know. And I don't even know who to ask. So a coach was really, really pivotal for me. And I felt like I had a lot to offer in that way. Mm -hmm. And I had the business experience to know what that would be like to start my own business because Being a coach is one thing. Running a coaching business is a very different different thing. thing. Yeah, right. It's not easy. It's no joke. So I felt like I had what I needed to make that happen. And so I dove in and I went back and got my certification. Um, I wanted the tools. I wanted the community. I wanted all those things to add to my experience. And I've been doing this for five years now. And I have a full client load. I run a group coaching program. I do work with corporate leadership teams that I love, have my own podcast, get to talk to cool people like you. Um, And in that way, I've sort of built this world for myself that I can give deeply one-on-one and play bigger. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I hit the lottery. I mean, I know I worked hard and I made it happen, but I now have a second career Mm -hmm. that makes me get up in the morning before the alarm goes off. So, you know, like this is living the dream. I love it. Amazing. I love it. Sorry, go ahead, Laurie. Just that that purpose driven career, right? What whatever whatever connection point is is authentic for you, um, whether it's direct or if it's maybe a couple of layers indirect. Um, what, if you can find that purpose that's at the center of it all, it makes the day to day crapola that we all have to deal with. <laughs> you know, you can recenter around, but this is why you know. Yeah. So I, I love hearing your story of creating that twice Thanks. for yourself. Thanks. I really feel like, like the ability to tap into what I love and turn it into a business that supports my family and my whole premise, like my own podcast, fulfilling career, happy life. Like that's, 
that's the ultimate privilege in the best of sense. Mm -hmm. And if we are in that position, it's, it almost feels like an obligation to be grateful and to do something with it. So anyway, I'm going to stop because I'm, <laughs> I'm on the pedestal. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Eric. <laughs> no, I, I, I love it so much. I love that story. And say the name of your podcast once again for everybody. Fulfilling Career, Happy Life. What's not to love about that? That is that's what I think. apple pie and baseball right there. Yeah. Right. I think that's that's what everybody's looking for. And, you know, you hit this sort of crossroads, this nexus point where you <laughs> had to make a decision. You were assisted um, in that in that regard, but uh, you had to make a choice. And one of the questions I think people struggle with, I mean, humans are creatures of pattern. We know this. We we do things because that's the way we do them. Um how do you figure out what you want long term? Like, because you took a a total ninety degree turn from from corporate sales positions to changing lives in a totally different way. How do people figure out what they want long term? Yeah, I really did, Eric. And you know, there's some threads that tie through what I did then and what I do now. But one of the other big things I did was leave the corporate security, the corporate, you know, piggy bank that I worked hard for, but, and then to dive in on my own, where if I didn't, you know, it's like you, I hate the analogy. I almost said you eat what you kill. That really sounds horrible. <laughs> you, you, you eat what you harvest. How about that? There we go. It's a, it's a vegan <laughs> <Yeah>. hunting experience. <laughs> exactly. That's much better. The much gatherer kinder. side versus the hunter <laughs> Much side. kinder. Yeah. So <laughs> no, I do. And, you know, I think taking that risk was it, I had, I was so intentional about getting out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Like for me at different points in my career, I literally would put on my calendar every day. What have you done to get uncomfortable today? Mm -hmm. Because that's where growth Sounds is horrifying. like that, that anxiety. <laughs> and it's so funny, Ruby, when I heard you talk about losing your phone, that gives me anxiety. Like jumping out there on my own, I can handle. I've done that. If I lost my phone, I wouldn't be able to focus right now. <laughs> um, but it's that. It, it, when, when you're nervous, when you're on, mm -hmm. pushing that edge is where growth happens. And so that for me personally, that doesn't happen when I play it safe. Mm -hmm. And so I had to take a leap. I had to get uncomfortable. And I remind myself of that all the time. And now I rationalize that by saying, well, the really hard things that I go through only make me a better coach. I'll <laughs> only be able to help my clients do this better. So in some ways it's, true. In some ways it is a rationalization, but I think it's again, to the point you made, Lori, tapping into that purpose. All mm -hmm. right. If I got to go through this really hard thing, I'm going to find meaning in it mm -hmm. and I'm going to use it to help other people. Yeah. yeah getting cool. uncomfortable is hard. It's, it's again, it's that hard professionally and it's hard <laughs> personally. It's well, hard. and you know, you mentioned the pandemic before Eric and the changes that all of us have had to made into make into our working styles. And I think that's the ultimate example of getting uncomfortable. Like talk about all of us being out of control and having our lives turned upside down and having to figure it out. And, and it was this weird collective experience in an incredible lonely way. Mm -hmm. Like it was just so surreal in so many ways. And, and I don't know if it's ever going to leave us completely. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's interesting. <clears throat> I was thinking about this conversation earlier today. Um, I had to do a very mundane human experience thing. I had to go to the grocery store. And I was in the grocery store and I'm picking up the items that I'm looking for. And, and as I'm doing it, uh, you know, I pass this couple of people because we're going in opposite directions. Like they're, they're, a, they're a come from the right person and I'm a come from the left person and we just keep <laughs> passing each other. And it just made me, it made me laugh. And I, we, we had this, you know, little moment and I felt, I felt happy in that moment. And, you know, we got a lot going on. Life is hard. It's complicated. Taxes just happened, right? It's everything. Right. And in that moment, I thought, I feel, I feel really good. And I'm going to, I'm going to sit in that for a minute. And it made me think there was a, a, a topic quote on your one sheet. It said, your life is happening now don't just power through to hit the next milestone, whatever that is. And I think, especially in American business culture, we don't, we don't stop and do that, right? We are so, so outcome focused. 
so directive driven that, you know, there's always work to be done. And, and I always say to people that work will fill whatever size vessel you give it. And, and it was that your life is happening now, kind of a wake up call for me. It was just in the moment in the store. And I thought, wow, that that's what that means. Um, how do you help people in your coaching practice understand that? Well, you know, it's really interesting because I would say people that seek out coaching, there, there there's some similarities to them. And one of this, one of the traits there is that they're, they're somewhat problem aware. They may not be aware right. what the problem is, but they're, there's something's itching, right? Something's not quite right. <laughs> and what so, happens when there's an itch, Randy? You got to scratch. You got to scratch. <laughs> you got to scratch. Magic right there. There it is. Oh, my world is complete. Okay, I'm out. I'm done. I'm going. Mic drop. Yeah. Thank you, Eric. I appreciated that. Um, so so the people that come to me are are already aware that something isn't quite right. So sometimes where the work starts is trying to figure out what that is. I actually did have a client not that long ago who started who who her objective was my life is amazing. I got to do some work to keep it this way. It was like such a cool perspective, but that's very, you know, that's the unicorn. Most people do have um, something that that needs to be solved for. So then a lot of times it's just, it's trying to analyze a little bit about what's the current situation. And sometimes then the leap is doing some dreaming about what's their ideal. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Lori, we were talking before about the, the powerful questions that a coach can ask and things like that. And so sometimes an early session that I do with clients is about what's your ideal situation? You know, imagine that you're as happy as you know how to be. You're like, everything's going your way. What's your boss like? What's your work environment like? Who's the team that reports to you? How much money are you making? How much are you traveling? And just like putting together the dream of top of mind thoughts about what's the ideal situation. And so sometimes envisioning that can help you identify where the gaps are. But it's really hard for us to sit at our desk by ourselves and do that. You got to talk it out with somebody. And obviously I'm a huge believer in coaching, not, and it's not (laughs) self-serving. It's really interesting. I used to like really hold back on, don't talk about how great coaching is because it's (laughs) self-serving, but it's, it's backwards for me. I don't think coaching is great because I am a coach. I am a coach because I know how great coaching is. Mm -hmm. I know how much it helps people move forward. And so I don't hold back on that anymore because I'm not helping anybody by not talking about that. So Mm -hmm. you got to talk to somebody. If it's a coach, that's awesome because we have no agenda other than helping you meet your goal, Mm -hmm. but it could be a friend. It could be a spouse. It could be, you know, if we're really lucky, it's our boss. It could be anybody that can ask that question, those questions and get us to dreaming about it. So it's like figuring out what the dream is, figuring out what our current state is, and then putting an action plan together that can help us close the gaps even a little bit. Like, you know, if the dream is a 10 and we're at a two, maybe we're not trying to get to a 10. Maybe we're trying to get to a three or a four and Mm -hmm. it will make a difference. It, it's making me think about, it's top of mind for me because we at Cable Labs, a technology company, a big focus of ours is innovation. And this week is an innovation boot camp. It's one of the immersive teaching experiences that we offer. And one of the key principles around innovation is about assumptions and identifying mm-hmm. the assumptions And what's cool about that, whether, you know, and it's within some sort of topic, but I think it applies like, all right, I'm in this space, good, bad, and different, but what are my, what are my assumptions about any of it? And sometimes the assumptions can be limiting, right? The assumptions are, I'm never going to be able to, that isn't ever possible, right? There's all the the limiting beliefs, which are just killers, um, but sometimes then by identifying those, then you could start to shift that and to say, I've identified all of these lim- limiting beliefs. What if that one's not true? What if that one's not true? What does that it. look like? Right. And that's, that's one of the keys to ideation, right? That's one of the keys to being expansive in 
I, you know, you, you do your, what's the problem discovery piece. You think about the assumptions and then you can get into that, that ideation of what are the hundred ways that I could solve that problem, especially if I don't let those assumptions be limiting. I love what you're saying. And, you know, it's interesting because I think one of the things that differentiates me from other coaches a little bit is, is my business background. And I have an MBA and I spent so many years you know, focused on P&Ls and building forecasts and all of that. And I take that kind of a business planning approach to career planning. And what you just said made me think of all of the forecasts that I built, which are based on assumptions. So in the farmer world, that might be, what's our historical sales trend been? What are we forecasting in new competitors? What share do we think they'll take? What are our price assumptions? All of these things. But the thing about a sum, and so if senior management come to me and say, I don't agree with your top line forecast number, I'd say, okay, cool. Let's look at the assumptions. This, this mm-hmm. is math. Which one do you disagree with? Which one should we change and tweak? Let's see what the number is. And the reality of that isn't so relevant to what you're saying, Lori, is assumptions are very rarely facts. Right. They're, they're <laughs> stories we tell ourselves. Exactly. They're based on something, mm-hmm. but we can change them. If we, if we challenge them, if we look at them, if we shine some light on them, we can change them and essentially get out of our own way yes. because so often we're the limitation, like mm. our own thoughts, our own, the messages from when we're children, even, or whatever, 100%. you know, it's so true for us, but that doesn't mean it's true. That's right. Yeah. We, we have a saying about assumptions here at sky team. Uh, when I first, started working with Morag, I, I, I had her review a business plan that I had written and she looked at it and she goes, yeah, it's good. I mean, it's great. She said, and, um, it's all assumptions. It's all her words, wishes, ponies, and unicorns until the checks in the bank. You can put whatever you want on the paper. Right. And to your point, Randy, I, I think, I think we put a lot of things on our own papers that, that m- may we may believe them to be true because we've always thought that way, or we had an experience that led us to, to go that way. Um, Mm -hmm. But to your point, right. They may not be true. They may be true in our experience or consistent with things that we've observed in the past, but not truths. Yeah. And you know, if it's something we've experienced in the past, boy, we are good at building a case for why we are right about something. You can point to all this evidence about why you're right about something, but it doesn't necessarily serve you for sure. And and something you said sparked a thought for me, Eric, you said something about, you know, the, 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 I forget the words that you use, but like the, the stripes we put on the wall, the, the lines we put on our story, whatever the words you used. But the important thing to think of, too, is what's the stuff we're leaving out? Mm. Because we so often will tell ourselves we're less than or not give ourselves credit for the things that we've done. And then that becomes truth. And if you just think about like, wow, would I say to someone that I loved and cared about the things that I'm now saying to myself? Like, we just don't realize how powerful that voice can be for ourselves, too. And it's another example of how talking it out with someone else can help challenge those things that are close to becoming truth for us, even though they may not be true. Because left on our own, Randy, we love us some confirmation bias, right? I mean, <laughs> oh yeah, we can yeah. do that all day long. Absolutely. And it's interesting. Something else you said, Lori, connects there too with the social media of the algorithms narrow us in on the things that we see and the things we believe in. Essentially, that is confirmation bias. It's Mm -hmm. all around us and you kind of got to fight it. Yeah. So I have to share this, this one funny um, illustration that we give during boot camp around assumptions. And it's so like 1998, what we knew to be true. Don't get in strangers cars. Don't meet people from the internet. 2016, literally summon strangers from the internet so that you can get in their car. (laughs) Right? That's so true. The world, the, the turtle and the world are turned upside down. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. So those, those absolute truths are, are a billion dollar business now. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, and just thinking about how people challenged with meeting uh, other romantic interests these days, mm-hmm. you do it on the internet 
<laughs> in a in a forum which you get no context you get a picture and a short bio and you're gonna swipe one way or the other cool and then you're gonna summon a stranger from the internet to drive you to meet the stranger that you don't yet know what you know it's funny because i've been married for 31 years i feel very lucky about that but so i missed that whole mm. in online dating thing and so to me it's almost like a foreign language it's like a real curiosity for me <laughs> Yeah, from what I gather, um, it sucks. This one, and that's <laughs> that's what I hear. It's terrible. <laughs> so, you know, thinking about these things, getting stuck, and being being in a job, and we're sort of riding the wave of the pattern that we're we're in. If you're feeling stuck or unmotivated, how do you how do you suss out what's really going on here? How do you dig out what the real problem is? Because there's a lot of presenting symptoms, to use your pharma world here, that may not be indicative of the underlying disease. Oh, absolutely. It's a great analogy. So, and that's work that I, you know, one of the beauties of running my own company is if I if I need a tool and it doesn't exist, I just develop it. And so I actually, from doing work with clients like that, I developed a career satisfaction assessment, which is not hmm. magic. It's... It, what I've come up with is eight pillars of career satisfaction. Then it, I'll give you the link. People can download it for free. It's really easy to do. But there are things like growth, balance, fun, contentment. Like there's there's eight different ones. And the reason that I like a tool like this that's fairly simple is it's a great place to start. Mm -hmm. I, I give some instructions. And in fact, actually on my YouTube channel, I can walk you through it workshop style if you want it. But basically, it just it gives you a place to start with what might be the problem. Mm -hmm. And that just yeah. unlocks something. These eight pillars that I've developed based on the work with my clients and things that I've read may not be the answer for you. But I guarantee that asking yourself the questions and taking yeah. the time to just give it some thought will unlock something. It will unlock either a different idea for you. You may latch on that. Yeah, this is something. There, Two of these are issues for me. I got to figure out how to solve them maybe I can solve them right where I am. Like, for example, if, you know, if making a difference is one of the pillars, as I mentioned, it was for me, you know, if you're working in a big corporation and look, there's stuff we have to do. We, you know, we're working for a reason. We need, we need money. We need benefits. We need whatever you do it. But if you need to know that you're making a difference and you're not feeling it in your day to day, if you talked to your boss, if you went to HR, any of the professionals here and talked about what are some ways I can get connected, like companies that I've worked in, with in the past have had big charitable community initiatives, you can sign on, you can get involved with an organization, they will help you and support you, it's good for the company too. So sometimes identifying what it is and asking right where you are, maybe what does it for you. Um, so it just it's taking a step. Like the best way to get unstuck is to do one thing oh, to, yeah. you know, just take one action in one direction. Even if it's, and some of you may relate to this. I'm a huge one for to-do lists. I love my to-do lists and I have to write them out in pen and paper because it's so satisfying to cross them off. Okay. There you go. Okay. Now tell me the truth, Eric, do you ever write things on there that you've already done just for the satisfaction of the check mark? Fuck yeah, I Morag do. does. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Credit, credit but take, for that. Yeah, right. Good for me. Good for me. I did that. Oh, <laughs> <there's movies. laughs> yeah. Absolutely. I do it as an excuse for why I didn't get to the things I should have done, because look at how busy I was at these things that were distracting me. <laughs> Absolutely. Morag, Morag, Talk about magic. building your own story. That's very convincing. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, but it, it's it's so funny because sometimes just the act of writing down the tasks that you have to do and then you can see it, it makes you feel more in control somehow. And so it's not like, what is that one action is different. The, the people here in the, in the community will have different answers to that, but whatever it is for you, take that one action, that mm -hmm. one step, it breaks that log jam. It breaks that immobility and you're in motion. And mm -hmm. a saying that I absolutely love is you can't steer a parked car. So you got to get in gear, you got to get moving, even if it's five miles an hour, <laughs> and then you can start to course correct. So I just get that. in motion. It doesn't matter if you're headed in the wrong direction, move and fix it. Mm -hmm. You can't steer 
a parked, parked car. That's in front of me all the time. Oh, I on love my, it. Because oh. I get stuck. Mm-hmm. Oh, man. Yeah. that That's worth the price of admission right there, Randy. That's <laughs> yeah. good stuff. That gift, deserves my magic gift tunes. You. That deserves magic. Say, all right, let's do this properly so I can make, I'll even make a short little teaser video about this. Say, say the phrase, Randy, ready, go. You can't steer a parked car. You got to move. Magic. (laughs) That that is magic right there. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's true. And I think we all get stuck. You know, and and really what is stuck? It's those voices in our head. It's us getting in our own way Mm -hmm. in some way. And I don't say that for any to put any shame because, my God, we all do it. But here's the great news. If we're what's in the way, we can get out of the way. Mm -hmm. It's just about being aware of it. Mm -hmm. And that might be talking it through with somebody else. Some people, you know, that thing that I used to put on my calendar. What have you done to get uncomfortable lately? Like we develop our own toolkit for how we can do it. And I mean, that's the beauty for me of if my daughter is now 27, obviously I'm not. And the beauty of having those eight, those years in the bank are the wisdom that comes along with it. So, Mm -hmm. um, you know, having that bit of introspection and that willingness to take a look at what may be wrong, even if what's wrong is me, um, so that you can fix it. Mm. So I, I love how this is, it's making me think about, um, some research I did on burnout, which is a can be another way of being stuck, right? Mm-hmm. And it was it was research that was done by the World Health Organization because they actually recognize burnout as a syndrome, like a like a not mm-hmm. a medical diagnosis, but a syndrome before the pandemic, right? It was already there. And, and they, they put it in, it was, they were trying to describe the felt experience people were having and they put them into three different buckets and, and they were um, like just exhaustion, whether it's mentally or physically, just exhaustion, no energy for this, can't get motivated. Um, Another was um, cynicism, like cynical detachment. Like I just like not only am I maybe exhausted is more apathetic, cynical is more like that sucks and that sucks and that's like that's a little more active, right? And then the other, which we've been talking about, is that that loss of control, that feeling of like nothing that I do matters. I have no gription on getting any traction on anything. And and what I loved about how they talked about it was to your point, you can't move a park. You can't steer a parked car. All right. If I know I'm feeling this way, what are my choices? And it, and it was getting, getting people to think about, even if, even if you're still working on the cause of, of these things, are there things that you can do to help change your felt experience? And, you know, that, that energy depletion or exhaustion was that boundaries piece, like stop doing so much, (laughs) like really take stock and cut out the things or, you know, take the breaks or whatever you need. Um, Interesting that the the cynicism was more about focus on other people, be of service to other people, find ways to help other people feel good, because then that makes you feel good. Right. So it kind of breaks the cynicism and I, yeah. I I love that so much. And it doesn't have to be something earth shattering. Eric talked about going right. down the grocery store aisle and smiling at people. Yes. Like, yes. That's not nice. in a creepy way, Randy. Just, I want to be very <laughs> clear about that. I, I okay, wasn't good. like that guy. <sighs> it was, it was, you turn it was your a... cart around, start following them. <laughs> Stop it. Swipe they left, it. swipe left. <laughs> Wait, is that is swipe left the reject button? I think that's the reject. Okay, yeah. See, I told you I, I don't know what I'm talking about here. I'm totally, totally out of my depth. No, but I think the things that you're saying, that definition of like burnout as a syndrome, Lori, is is pretty powerful. And it's a good way to think about it because it's like not all of those things have to apply for you to mm-hmm. to be feeling burnout. But if you think about that, if someone's feeling that exhaustion, lack of control, whatever. That is not a place from which anyone will take a risk. That's Mm -hmm. a place to get safe. Mm -hmm. And when you think about it, almost anything we do is taking a risk of like even handing in a report to your boss or delivering on some work or whatever Mm -hmm. is taking a little bit of a risk because you're delivering something, you're, you're forming opinions, you're asserting a position, not a big risk. But if you're that burnout, if all of that's going on for you, you're going to retreat to the point where all you're going to do is play it safe. 
And that's not a place from which you make an impact. And Mm -hmm. who wants to go through life vanilla and never make an impact? Even if you're going to ruffle feathers sometimes, even if you're going to be wrong sometimes, Mm -hmm. like you're going to get through it, but you know, make a difference. Yeah. Why be dull? That's what I say. I was I, it, right when she said that Lori changed her background to something really cool. And I was like, that's not dull. That's nice. I know. I saw it. I loved it. <laughs> I was searching for my pink sparkles. I found it. I love it. <laughs> I love Back pink on. sparkles. I don't, See, don't, don't talk to me about the filters, though. I'm going to go in and like put on a, a mask or a pirate's hat or something. <laughs> <laughs> I love those. Awesome. This has been so much fun. Um, any questions for Randy? I, I, I see the smoke coming out of Ruby's ears all the time. So I know, she, <laughs> I know she's probably got something to say because Ruby does a lot of coaching. And I I like watching Ruby's face when, when the guest is talking because something will happen and her eyes will pop open and she writes something down. <laughs> I know. It's and fun. I, I, I've been watching. You're very expressive, Ruby. <laughs> but... So I don't know what you got, Vesley. You got a question? Uh, I just... I think I mentioned this uh, recently, but um, I've been thinking a lot about uh, the Yumi We concepts around an ally mindset and it's being an ally, showing up as a friend to other people. And I've really been thinking about well, what does it mean to be an ally to yourself, right? We have to do both. Um, and in that model, the the first component that I'm really just stuck on is this abundance and generosity with self. Mm-hmm. If we do not connect with ourselves, we cannot think about what do we want? What am I longing for? What's important? Why would I do this? Do I need to do this thing? Do I still want to be in this job? Do I care about this relationship? Are these boundaries okay for me? Right? Like we don't even have a moment to dive in and connect with ourselves, which is the second component, and be compassionate. And then there's courage and vulnerability. And it's like, you mentioned risk. And if we are going to take risk, we're more willing to do the thing if it's actually connected to something we're really longing for in our lives. Right. So it's like, that's important. And then there's the action and accountability piece where we have to keep our commitments. We have to do something. We have to, I love this idea of you got to just take one step, take some action and, and do what you say you're going to do for yourself. But it really starts with that first component of, I've been using this term recently, lavish Mm self-care. Like, like whoa, we do that for our kids. I know those of you who are parents have done it for your children. Have you ever, ever turned it toward yourself? Ruby, I'm giving you a different magic for that. (laughs) (laughs) That's really powerful stuff that you're talking about, Ruby. And I think we don't, we don't even give ourselves permission to think about it, let alone do it. It feels Mm -hmm. self-indulgent or Mm -hmm. selfish or wrong or something. And I think, you know, I mean, it's maybe it's overdone, but like the analogy of the oxygen mask on an airplane, Yeah, you know, of course I was on a plane last week. And part of that announcement was if you're wearing a face covering, take it off before you put your oxygen mask on. And I thought, (laughs) Maybe if you need to be told that this is Darwin's way of keeping <laughs> the oxygen mask off. I like, but you, I Andy. digress. <laughs> oh, that is exactly oh, what we used to say when masks were required on the aircraft. I'm a flight attendant, by the way, Randy. Oh, are you? <laughs> That's hilarious. Freeman, yeah. are you got a question? You usually do too, so mm-hmm. want to make sure you have the opportunity. Yeah, I'm I'm actually preparing a webinar and getting unstuck uh, with a couple of colleagues. And and I love what you have to say. It totally resonates. But yeah, that one step that what whatever it is, because if you, you know, especially and, and this is geared to women. Mm-hmm. Oh, I have 12 things on my list. It's like, no, no, pick one, pick one, because then you won't do any of them. Mm-hmm. And I kid you not, one of my daughters in law, she was so sweet, it, just talking about the wedding photos from last fall. I need to go through and sort them, but I need to go. But if I can't get it all done at once, I'm just not going to do it at all. And I'm like, mm-hmm. okay, let's let's talk about that. <laughs> yeah. Chunking it Baby down. Steps. This this is Chunking a phrase down. that yeah. I I learned from Eric forever ago. <laughs> professionally, personally, right? Just this idea of, you know, when there's a big old hairball, right? Mm -hmm. And just keep adding hair to the hairball and nobody's taking any hair off the hairball. And it's like, (laughs) it's like what, 
And, and so then it's paralyzing. It's like, I can't, like I even stutter trying to even articulate it, right? And it's just this idea, chunk it down. And it's not, um, it's not walking away from it and it's not trying to solve the whole thing, but it's starting the car and moving five miles an hour. And, and I think I've, I've talked to my kids about that. You know, like they're overwhelmed by a thing. I'm like, let's just put it in three buckets. What's the first bucket, you know? And and just trying to get bite-sized things that we can feel we have control over. And the right in, in when you start thinking about that, then you also have the, you know, the control circle that we talk about. There are things that are out of our control. Name them, just name them because they lose power when you name them. You don't have to stress and sweat and cry about those. You just know that they're there. But I have all of these things inside the circle that I can control, right? So it's 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 that mindset. And it's not a natural mindset for most people. And it's something we but, have to learn or be taught, you know? It, but it, it makes sense because biologically, we're programmed to, if we see danger, or we feel threatened, it's fight or flight or freeze or something, you know, it's a biological thing. So it's just, it like makes sense that we get frozen by indecision or something. It feels like your body reacts the same way. If you, if you don't, if you don't know about going through your wedding photos, mm -hmm. or if you're getting chased by a grizzly bear, right? So you know, it's the just, same to your amygdala. <laughs> exactly. And then we just do a number on ourselves and it sort of takes on a life of its own. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's funny because my daughter at times has dealt with anxiety as I hear so many people do now. And a lot of times it was just getting her to focus, like get, be mindful for a moment, be present in the moment and just do one thing. And then like, you can move yourself past it. Yeah. Yeah. So true. I love it. All right. Well, Randy, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for being here today. We'll give you a real applause right now. Thank you. It's my pleasure to talk to you guys. I really enjoyed it. How do people find you if they hear this show and go, wow, I could use me some Randy in my life? How do they find you? Absolutely. Probably the best place to find me is my website, which is randyrobertscoaching.com. And Perfect. on there are some of the resources I mentioned, the career satisfaction assessment. You can find that there. You can also find links to my podcast, Fulfilling Career Happy Life, which the logo just happens to be right behind me. Um, and uh, so that my website is kind of a catch all for all those things. And if somebody wanted to send me a note or something, you can do that through there as well. You know, you can also find Randy Roberts on the TCB network because she joined today. That's right. right so on. I will put a link to uh, to her website over on the network. I will put it in the show notes for for the show today. And uh, I just love it. It's been such a fun conversation. Thanks for being here today. You know how we end the show. You're welcome. I know, to and I'm around. not going anywhere. I'm sticking All around right. for the funny stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So we've got funny stuff, good feels, and our silly, silly cocktail. Um, <laughs> Today's funny things. Funny thing number one, this is a, I don't know, it's a little edgy, but you know me. Um, that's what I do. I do edgy. Um, <laughs> this is a pack of chopsticks and it says, good luck on them. And the caption is, when the chopsticks know you're white. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> Lori says, um, oh boy. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> that feels like it needs a wah, wah. <laughs> 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 uh, funny thing number two uh, as all of us that have done things on green screens can relate to um, this is what my neighbor saw when she glanced over her fence at 1pm on a Tuesday <laughs> <laughs> it's a dude sitting on a chair in a hot dog suit in front of a green screen I wonder <laughs> What's going on behind him in the video that he's posted somewhere? My 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 comment to that would be swipe left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, so HBO Max to be named renamed Max with the addition of Discovery Plus content. The comment here is hopefully Peacock doesn't get any ideas from this. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as as being a person of a certain age uh, with the gray fur here depicting, 
I'm 50. All celebrity news looks like this. Curtains for Zusha, K-Smog, and Bat Boy caught flipping a grunt. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's me I always, have no idea. I don't understand. <laughs> me too. <laughs> exactly <laughs> i'm like i don't know any of these people it's like when i watch an award show and i'm like i don't know who's giving the award i don't know who's getting the award I yeah no none uh this was my almost favorite funny thing today 41 years ago today johnny cash hosted snl with elton john as the musical guest oh my God. prior to elton's performance they switched outfits yes. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Wow. Amazing. Funny. It's Johnny Cash in a feather boa with feather glasses <laughs> and, and Elton John in a cowboy hat and a leather jacket. The man in black. It's pretty darn great. Um, my favorite funny thing today, Christopher Lloyd in the Mandalorian and then Christopher Lloyd, man in the DeLorean. The DeLorean. Yes. <laughs> that was good. Yes. Uh, uh, today's good feel story is from the faith in humanity department. These kids today. Now CBS's Steve Hartman goes. On. Oh, Steve Hartman. You do it every week. I love so it. So good. Much. God, so I love good. that. So right, my, faith. my 83 year old father who's in Europe right now. So he props to him. He'll have his cell phone and we'll say, dad, you need to turn it on. But I'm not expecting any calls. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah. Fantastic. Thanks, Pops. <laughs> uh, today's semi quarantine cocktail is champagne brew. This is a riff on the black velvet. You're going to need this is an easy cocktail. So it's only two things one part Guinness. You will also need 2,352 cans of Miller High Life, a bunch of pissed off Belgians. <laughs> One part champagne, 120 year old motto. <laughs> and this, I think Miller was, they're stretching here. With its elegant clear glass bottle and crisp taste, Miller High Life has proudly worn the nickname, the champagne of beers <laughs> for almost 120 years. Um, the committee champagne in Belgium asked for the destruction of a shipment <laughs> of those 2,352 cans on the grounds that their century old motto used infringes on the protected designation of origin champagne. Cause remember <laughs> you can't call it champagne unless it's produced in France, but I think we all ought to be living the high life. I am so <laughs> thankful for all of you. Thanks for being here today. Thanks to Randy Roberts. Check her out. Come on, come back next week. We've got fun stuff planned. Guests are plenty. We'll see you soon. Go have some dinner. Thank you so much for joining us today. If you had a good time and learned a thing or two at today's happy hour, please share it with your friends. If you want to join our tribe, head on over to skyteam.cloud forward slash TCB or email us at info at skyteam.com. That's S-K-Y-E team.com. Thanks again. And remember, you've always got friends at the Corporate Bartender. <laughs>